Good morning, all. Uh, Dr. Pete here. Um, today's live broadcast will be an informal discussion. My 10 strategies uh, to put gout in remission. My 10 strategies to stop gout. If you haven't listened to me before, my name is Dr. Pete. I have a PhD in biochemistry. I am also a nutrition network health practitioner. I actively coach individuals, have been doing that for many years now. I've talked to hundreds of people in various electronic forums. The inspiration uh, for today's broadcast uh, came from an email that I recently uh, received. And uh, the reason that I'm responding to that email is because this particular communication is very similar uh, to the emails, many, many, many emails that I've received over um, a lot of years now. And basically that email is, I have gout, I'm super suffering, you know, what do I do? Usually these people are at the end of their rope. That's basically, you know, in terms of my own clients, I, I, I collectively am working with people who are at the end of their rope with this. And, and you know, they've utilized all the different, or they've accessed all the different um, the types of communications that they can get. They watch YouTube videos and whatnot, and, and they have moved past all of the influencers out there that say, you know, just do this and that's the end of your problems. Just eat this and that's the end of your problem and so on down the road. So I decided when I responded to the email, because there are basically like 10 points in my head when I respond to an email like that, that I'm going to write out and then respond and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I want everyone to understand going into this that gout is not a singular sliver in the finger disease that is independent of anything else that's going on in your body. Gout is a systemic illness that comes from the overconsumption of certain macronutrients we, we, uh, on a chronic level. And we're going to talk about that this morning as we go through these points, the 10 points. And it is driven by the same central biochemistry that drives diabetes, obesity, non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver disease, Alzheimer's, uh, the whole cadre of metabolic diseases. One of the main drivers of insulin resistance is this biochemical pathway. And so one of the fundamental things that I want you to think about as we go through this is that if you've received a gout diagnosis, the likelihood that some of these other things are not going on in you is very slim. And I will talk about the, the statistics here in regard to that last statement. So my point is, one of the things I want you to know going into this is that if you are a gout sufferer, right, you need to do some blood work and you need to ask questions about your metabolic health and find out if you have these other things going on. Uh, for example, kidney disease, which I think I didn't mention in that long list, right? This is another fundamental illness that is driven by fructose uric acid metabolism. And even when I say what that metabolism is, keep in mind, we're not talking about a singular type of metabolic maladaptation. We're talking about biochemical pathways that are integrated. So fructose uric acid metabolism is integrated with glycolysis, which is connected to our mitochondria, which are, which are responsible for burning, right? And producing the currency of the cell, which is ATP that we use to do things. So this is a simplistic way to look at it, but these pathways are all integrated. And what we're talking about here are the nuances in how, uh, and, and we could talk about multiple organs here, but I'm going to focus on the liver. So we're, we're really talking about how the liver is dealing with incoming macronutrients that are coming in in a high load in a short period of time, which is characteristic of the standard American diet. So without further ado, let's start getting into my 10 strategies. There is no silver bullet for this. There is no pill that you can take and then you're done with gout. And in the 10 strategies I'm talking about, this is a lifestyle change. It takes time. This is something to be patient about. And certainly as we go through this, 
don't try to do everything at the same time. Because if you do everything at the same time, and then there is an issue that comes up, like you have a gout flare in the midst of it, how do you know what the problem is? You can't possibly identify that if you're one of these people that decides, okay, I'm going to do all of this and I'm going to do it all at once. And I always push back against that. I've worked with a lot of clients who have ended up with me because in the beginning, that's what they did, right? They just piled all this intervention on at once. And then there were all kinds of problems that came up and trying to identify what exactly the issue was for them uh, was very problematic. Strategy number one, the main drivers of, uh, of fructose uric acid metabolism, and uh, there's very strong uh, circumstantial evidence that this is going on in the synovial fluid of our joints, is to eliminate the drivers of the metabolism that's driving this maladaptation. So hyperglycemia, eating foods that are high in refined sugars, for example, refined glucose. Um, and, and we'll talk about this more as we go into this, but having a meal, when you, if you imagine looking down at the plate, this just piled high in potatoes with some kind of, of, of sauce on it that more than likely has um, sugars in it. And uh, umamis, for example, the, and when I say umami, I mean things that are high in glutamate, inosine monophosphate, and so on, which is very typical, like yeast extract, very typical in store-bought sauces, for example. We eliminate sugar altogether because sugars, uh, regardless of its form, will contain both glucose and fructose. And exogenous fructose, fructose coming in with sugar that you are eating, that you have added to the food, or that was added to, to processed food, activates these pathways directly. Hyperglycemia via the polyol pathway also activates this metabolism. And that's why we're talking about eliminating hyperglycemia. More on that in a little bit. One of the crucial things is to eliminate processed food uh, and processed meat, because in both of those cases, they have not only added sugar, which again brings in large quantities of glucose and fructose together, but processed food also will be high in umami. This, this usually, uh, when you look at labels, because the food processors have learned that people are triggered by MSU, monosodium glutamate, right? They see that and they're like, okay, I shouldn't be eating that. So now they're, they're putting like celery powder, um, yeast extract, all of these are replacements to drive eating of processed food, right? The need to, to consume more of it. So processed food, the added sugar, the umami that is coming in there uh, need to be eliminated. And then finally, another aspect of this that I've come into recently is to get tested for sleep apnea and eliminate it if you have a problem with that. The reason for this is because intermittent hypoxia through the night activates fructose uric acid metabolism. And uh, many people suffer from sleep apnea, uh, me included, although my apnea was mild, I think it was more severe when I was eating the standard American diet along with my alcohol consumption. I think it was was uh, aggravated, if you will, under those conditions. It definitely improved when I went into the low carb lifestyle because one of the first things I noticed was that my sleeping improved. But later on, when I started looking at the, the experimental data behind how our chondrocytes, these are the biologically important cells that operate in the joint, are operating in a natural hypoxic environment and because oxygen has to diffuse from the circulatory system into the joint and then through the fluid to those cells. So there's a natural hypoxic gradient. And this is going to be true in all of our organ systems. Some organ systems, the hypoxic gradient is more or less than others, which should make common sense to everybody. But my point is, is that if you're suffering from sleep apnea, over the course of a night, then the hypoxic gradient, whatever it is, is going to be shifted into a much higher magnitude. 
And that hypoxia, when it's shifted into a higher uh, magnitude, is activating the very metabolism that we are trying to minimize. It is activating fructose uric acid metabolism. So uh, no matter what the situation is, if you're a gout sufferer, you should get tested for sleep apnea and see what's going on with this. Um, unfortunately, the only hard data we have for this is epidemiological. And if you listen to me a lot, you know that I don't like that kind of data because it's associational. Um, it's not causal. But because I'm very confident of the biochemistry, which is well-defined in, in our joints, and we are dealing with a hypoxic environment here, I think it's a very intelligent thing to do to get sleep tested if you suffer from gout. And if it comes back that you uh, have sleep apnea, uh, then you should get treated. And there's a variety of treatments out there. Um, try to find the one that is least invasive. All right, let's move on. Uh, point number two, you're going to shift to a, a lifestyle which is whole real food. Now, there's a lot of really like top notch influencers out there that talk about this, like um, Dr. Lustig, for example, uh, moving to a whole food, whole real food uh, eating lifestyle is super important. And the reason that it is, is because processed food on any kind of level uh, has been manipulated. And the, the thing that we're concerned about that opens fructose uric acid metabolism uh, predominantly in the liver, the kidney. Also, I believe in the chondrocyte. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence for this that is clinical and also in vitro in the test tube, looking at the cellular uh, environment. The processed food has been optimized for sugar and optimized for other compounds like glutamate, inosine monophosphate, and so on. And even in the whole food environment, you must realize, for example, because this always comes up, I'm always asked these questions in email. Well, what about fruit? Well, look at the fruit and use common sense. This stuff has now been bred to be a uh, higher in sugar and larger, you know, and I have yet to meet uh, any client uh, that I've worked with over the years that isn't eating a substantial amount of this stuff chronically every single day, year in and year out. Um, it appears in the lifestyle all the time. And there's always a really strong pushback about eliminating it because of what we've been told since the nutritional guidelines came out, first written in 77 and then published in 1983 that we need fruit in order to be healthy, right? Um, and especially people that are suffering from sugar addiction, which is another byproduct of the standard American diet, which is high in sugar, um, probably combined with alcohol if it's an adult and so on. So a whole, uh, a whole real food uh, eating lifestyle is super important here. Buy, buying food that is food, cutting it up and eating it. We're going to eliminate the grains, the potatoes, and the sugar. One of the main reasons we're doing this, or the main reason, is because we need to decrease um, hyperglycemia. And uh, the reason we need the hyperglycemia to come down, people, is because it activates the polyol pathway, especially in combination with alcohol and salt. Also, the input of umami from the processed food, right? This uh, hyperactivates polyol. And then the fructose uric acid metabolism, big spike in uric acid in, in the liver. The liver pushes the uric acid out into the circulatory system where it makes its way to all of our other organs, including the brain and the kidneys the, and, and eventually into the chondrocytes, right? The synovial fluid uh, diffusing down a concentration gradient into the synovial fluid. Then that soluble uric acid can interact with the chondrocytes. We can get a crystallization issue going on there. Then we activate the macrophage uh, um, that has uh, very similar biochemistry, but, but higher in magnitude than in the chondrocyte. And we can get the cascade into a gout flare. So we need to reduce uh, the foods that generate high levels 
of glucose. The processed food and sauces. Sauces are super bad because they are going to have added sugar in them most likely. They are going to have a combination of umami, as I've already talked about. Commercial salad dressings are super bad. I tell people when, when I go into these boutique supermarkets without mentioning names and I go to the salad dressing shelf, it's amazing how bad they are. Stay away from the sauces. Cut out the processed food. Processed meats are, are an issue. And I know in the ketogenic environment, we hear this all the time. Well, you know, uh, there's the sausages, there's the bacon, and there's all this stuff. And I'm not saying that you can't eat that stuff. I do eat bacon and I do eat sausage, but I, I source it locally. I would not ever, I try to avoid at all costs buying that kind of stuff in a regular supermarket because it has been bastardized. And the and you and you can test this yourself. If your finger sticking for uric acid and you buy some bacon in the in the supermarket, and you have four or five pieces of it along with your eggs, you're you're gonna see a substantial rise in uric acid post meal. Um, that's how I knew in the very beginning five years ago that I needed to stay away from that stuff. And even so, even the bacon that I get from a locally sourced area, I try. I try not to eat it all the time. I do the best I can with that. Remember later in this, and when I get to another strategy that I'm going to talk about, we will talk about biomarker monitoring because if you monitor your uric acid, you can determine by measuring finger sticking uric acid before a meal and then after the meal, what the effect of that meal is having on your uric acid. Because if you're getting a, a liver response, that uric acid is going to be pushed into your circulatory system within about a half an hour for sure, for sure. And you'll be able to readily see the spike by, by one hour, no question about it. This is anecdotal, if you will, but it's something that I've seen over and over and over again o over the years. And then finally, no desserts. I, I don't know what this is with the American culture, right? Even recently, I was at a social gathering and I, I, I sat there at this table and I listened to these people. How can you not, how can you have a meal and not have the dessert? It's like, oh my God, right? What do desserts all have in common? They're going to be super high in sugar, um, especially the added sugar, which, which is bringing in the glucose and the fructose. Well, another one of these things I'm going to talk about as we, we move into the strategies is being really consistent with, with your lifestyle. And these influencers that are out there that tell you, oh, you can schedule in cheat days. No, not if you're a gout sufferer, you can't. Or maybe if you decide to go down that road, let me just tell you, you're taking a risk. Um, because you have that cheat day and the likelihood that the following day, especially if you're a super sufferer, and I'm using the combination of those two words together because a certain number of people that I've worked with seem to be super sufferers. And if they do a cheat day, the following, you know, 24 hours later, they, they're suffering another flare. So forget the desserts, right? We're, we're in a different world with this. Uh, know your metabolic health. I've already talked about this a little bit. It's unusual for a gout sufferer not to have other conditions that are going on. And when I was first diagnosed with gout in 2016, the doctors said nothing to me about the fact that I, I, I could be diabetic. And I'm one of those guys that's relatively thin, right? So fat on the inside, thin on the outside. People assume when they, when they see people that are thin, relatively speaking, that they're not going to be sufferers of diabetes. And this is just simply not true, you know. And if the medical establishment understood that gout is driven by a central metabolic maladaptation, then they would be looking for these other conditions. So here are the statistics to talk to you about this. They appear in every single talk I ever give. You know, three quarters of the people that are gout sufferers also have high blood pressure. Uh, a full, almost three quarters of them are going to have some level of chronic kidney disease, um, which usually will show up in a metabolic panel as having a, a relatively low GFR, uh, glomular filtration rate. Uh, over half are significantly obese. When you combine that with overweightness, 
right? That statistic is pushed to 74%. Uh, about a full quarter uh, are going to be type 2 diabetic. I, I would have liked to have known this when I was diagnosed with gout. I, I had to go through three years more of life before I finally got the diagnosis of prediabetes. I had no idea they were connected. If you're diagnosed with gout, do the blood work and find out. And you might have an argument with your doctor about this. You know, they're going to be like, well, we don't really need to do all that stuff. You know, why do you want to do all that stuff? You just have gout. You just have the sliver in your finger. It is not like that. So you may have to actually contract the blood work on your own. A quarter of the people also are suffering from kidney stones. And then there's approximately about a 14, 10 to 14 percent percentage of people that in addition to the gout are going to be suffering from some form of cardiovascular disease. Um, they may have also already had a stroke in their life. So if you are also suffering from the comorbidities, then in addition to going to a whole real food environment where we brought the hyperglycemia down, right? And we've done the things I've already talked about. You may want to cut into the carbs. You know, in our medical establishment, there's still pushback on this. But here's the thing. If you go and you look at the science, the only lifestyle published clinical settings, biochemical analysis that have been shown, in particular, the clinical studies that have been shown to actually reverse this metabolic, these metabolic diseases, the diabetes, the obesity, the cardiovascular disease, the jury is still out on Alzheimer's, but reversal of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is cutting the carbs. You know, I don't care what any of these guys say. You, you can start with Verta Health. That's V as in very, I-R-T-A, health. Look up their papers. And then there are other guys out there like David Unwin. Look up his work, right? They just published a paper in 2023 about diabetes reversal. And then there are uh, like David Ludwig. Look up his papers, right? And you can find all of this really strong literature that shows the reversal of this comorbidity. And what does it have to do with gout? Because gout fundamentally is being driven by the same central maladaptation of this metabolism. That's why it has specialized conditions that actually lead to the flare. But if, if we reverse the pressure that's generated by that metabolism, then we've taken a step towards getting gout remission. When you go on a low carbohydrate uh, lifestyle as a gout sufferer, you're going to see your uric acid rise. That happens with everybody. And does, does this mean you're risking a gout flare? Yes, it does. The reason the uric acid rises when you cut the carbs is because the ketones that you are producing because of the uh, fat metabolism that is now going on in you, you're burning fat, you produce these ketones, and those ketones are, are being um, excreted at the level of the kidney, and they effectively compete with the uric acid. One argument made by the establishment and I don't, um, when I say establishment, I mean the low carb space, our space, is that once you undergo keto adaption, you will see the uric acid come down. Many of these guys are seeing that reduction in uric acid that seems to come with keto adaption as being a signal for keto adaption. The point is, is that keto adaption actually takes several months minimum. For some people, it's going to take significantly longer. In my case, it was at least a year before I really started to see my biomarkers make the shift. The best place, and this is anecdotal that I have found with myself, the best place to keep your ketones is to keep the ketones between 0.5 and 1 millimolar. This seems to have the least effect backing the uric acid up into your system. And I continue to have my ketones between 0.5 and 1 millimolar in my lifestyle, which I've been doing for five years now. No cheat plans, right? If you build cheats into this, which seems to be popular at the surface of the internet and keto, then you're setting yourself up for continued flaring and the continued fluctuation 
in uric acid. And as I'm going to talk about coming up, about the mobilization of uric acid that we are trying to prevent. So you need to get into an eating plan that is consistent and stay there, which brings me to point five, which is to be consistent with this. And strain from the lifestyle causes the mobilization of, of uric acid either up or down. The directionality of the uric acid doesn't seem to matter. Remember that uric acid in itself is not the cause of gout. And, and this is something that the medical establishment has missed. And you can go back decades. That's what I've done. I've looked at literature substantially starting in the mid 1800s coming forward, especially the stuff out of the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, which now seems to be completely ignored for whatever reason. Very high quality biochemical work that was done. We know, and I'm saying this emphatically, we know that uric acid is sufficient for a gout flare. You need to have it, but it, it is not the cause. It is not the causal factor. We also know that both soluble uric acid and crystalline uric acid are involved in the gout flare, both of them and the relationship between them. Lastly, how they're interacting in this cellular environment is the key thing, the key piece that's missing from understanding how some of us end up suffering from gout. These are specialized conditions that exist that are probably driven a combination of genetic factors. This is the unknown thing, how these pieces come together, protein factors that are interacting with the uric acid, the, the enzymology that's behind this, and those factors coming together are probably being set up for genetically because we know that not everybody in the world suffers from gout. But we also know that a substantial number of people, 43 million people minimum here in the U.S. are hyperuricemic. They have high uric acid but only a certain proportion of those people are ever going to suffer from a gout flare. So it's my assertion that the gout flare is happening because of specialized conditions that we know involve uric acid, right? The uric acid has to be there, but again, and it's a driver, but again, it can't happen without these other factors. And it's the other factors that are currently unknown that are involved in this cascade that leads to the gout flare. And then my last point about number five here is that gout loves inconsistency. Uh, is important to you from two points of view. Number one, the individual that's sick and tired of the whole business decides that they're just going to go whole hog and do everything at once and throw everything at the problem, right? You want to avoid doing that. Get the lifestyle first, then address other issues. And be. And the second part of it is be super consistent because it's where the inconsistency comes in that causes the mobilization of the uric acid, either shifting up or shifting down. And I'm going to talk more about this uh, coming up when we address urate lowering drugs. Keto adaption is super important. This is not a one-off. For those of us that suffer from metabolic diseases like diabetes and gout, unfortunately, we have to think about living a different lifestyle. This is the way it is. Cannot expect to do the things I'm talking about and do them for three or four months and then go back to the way, however it was that you were living before this. If you do that, the diabetes is going to come back and uh, and more than likely you'll be suffering from gout flares, you know, once again. Keto adaption takes a while. Um, and there's actually evidence uh, out of the Noakes lab and also other guys, um, um, uh, Jeff Volick and Steve Finney, who have looked at elite racers. And we know, for example, that even at 20 months with those guys, there's still some of those racers that are eating a nutritional a ketogenic diet that are still undergoing adaptations. So, you know, on the surface of the internet, we hear, oh, you know, you just, you, you go ketogenic for a couple of months and, and that'll be it. You're keto adapted or fat adapted. Sometimes they'll use that term. Honestly, 
this can take significantly longer. And I've already mentioned this, but in my case, it took me um, over a year before I really saw the keto adaption based on published uh, data. Number seven, gout is not druggable and neither is any of these other uh, metabolic diseases. So if you're watching the six o'clock news, especially the dancing commercials, if you guys know what I'm talking about, uh, where these people are leaping around happily on their diabetes drugs, those drugs are not treating the underlying cause of diabetes. They're treating symptoms. In terms of gout, one of the first things that will happen when we address this issue with our doctors that they will most likely suggest putting you on allopurinol. The problem with this is the assumption that uric acid actually is driving gout, which we know that it is not. These drugs are urate lowering drugs. Now, is there a good reason to lower the uric acid? And I actually think there's a good argument to be made for that. But let me just push that aside for a minute. You got to understand that allopurinol is not fixing your gout. That drug is not operating on the causal driver of gout because we actually don't know what that is exactly, right? We know that the uric acid is required in partnership with these other conditions, whatever that condition is, which I don't think is singular. All right. I don't think this is a single protein. I think that we got some things going on there, a cascade of events where some factors have to come together, which is a genetically driven environment that, that a certain number of us have out there that makes us preconditioned to getting a gout flare when, when these uh, other factors come together. And urate lowering drugs are not treating that. The thing about it is that for some gout sufferers, we know that uric acid is precipitating as a crystal in other soft tissues. There's actually been, uh, there is evidence out there that some people actually have crystallization happening on their heart valves. So is there a concern here? Is there a connection to cardiovascular disease epidemiologically? Yes. Do we, do we have circumstantial evidence that there could be an issue where uric acid is crystallizing on heart valves and also in the soft tissue, even on our spine and the in the lower back and in other tissues surrounding in the body, even in the retina of the eye, I believe. Uh, you would have to double check me on that. These are specialized conditions where this is happening, right? I've already talked about this genetic driver. So is there a reason to get the uric acid down? And I think there's a good argument to be made for that. And everyone who's a gout sufferer has to take this seriously. Remember that a urate lowering drug is not treating the underlying cause of gout. And it, in addition, as I've already pointed out, it is the mobilization, the fluctuation in uric acid that is connected to driving the flare directly. So that fluctuation can happen moving up in a spike or moving down. So when you go onto a urate lowering drug, you can have gout flares and there's strong evidence going for this, going way back in the literature. This has been known a long time. It, it, this is not some surprising event now. And if your doctor's talking to you about putting you on all purinol or one of the other drugs that will lower uric acid, you should, he should inform you about this that you, once you go on this drug, there is the possibility that you will suffer from a flare, right? You, you need to know that. So be prepared. If you go on an, a urate lowering drug, have the anti-inflammatories present or in your medicine cabinet so that you can respond to that flare. Also, if you get a localized flare on your foot or in your hand, and I've published a lot of videos on this, hot water treatment helps. I would encourage you to go out and find that video and take a look at it. This is different than if somebody suffering from uh, generalized arthritis, where cold treatment seems to be the key thing with that. In the case of a gout flare, the reason heat works is because some of the proteins that are involved in the actual flare are temperature dependent. They prefer a lower temperature. So if you warm the joint, a couple things happen. One, the pain is significantly reduced 
and the time frame of the flare seems to be uh, significantly shortened. So you might take a look at that. Number three on my uh, strategy, number seven here is anecdotally from testing these substances myself that tart cherry, quercetin, and also the amino acid glycine can uh, reduce uric acid. Are these unique compared to the formal urate lowering drugs? And the answer is no when it comes to the fact that when the uric acid comes down, when, when it is lowered, you are susceptible to a flare. So it's the same rule of thumb with the tart cherry, the quercetin, and the glycine. When you start that, that you may suffer from a flare. And I myself suffered from a flare on allopurinol when I started it, and my uric acid uh, concentration in my circulatory system based on finger sticking was in fact 4.5 megs per deciliter, well underneath the sort of cutoff that the doctors talk to you about, which is seven megs per deciliter. Number eight, when you talk to the establishment, what they're going to tell you is that the main driver of gout is protein consumption. All right, I have an issue with that. Protein consumption has been around ad infin infinium. Humans evolved from hunter-gatherers. Protein and fat has always been a part, part of our diet on one level or another, I, uh, along with the carbohydrates too. I'm not saying that they aren't, but in the case of protein, what I have found is that some gout sufferers, uh, their go-to foods, like I was contacted by somebody who every afternoon would go down to the pier, they would have three or four beers, and they would also eat oysters, and they were suffering from repeated flares. Well, oysters are high in, in uh, driving uric acid. Right, and beer is especially bad because it's a trifecta. Because you have the alcohol there, which activates this pathway. A lot of people don't want to hear that. You have high glucose in beer, the maltose that's in there, right? So you are generating a hyperglycemic environment paired with the alcohol, and then you also have because of the yeast to make the beer, you also have a high protein content which is going to generate a very large uric acid spike additionally in the liver, along with whatever food you're eating. In this case, it was oysters. So what I tell all of my clients and what I tell everyone when I talk about this, like today in an electronic forum, is that you should be eating protein. Uh, and those of us that are older need more of it. The key thing is make sure it's whole and make sure it's real. You cut it up and you cook it. And variety matters. Don't get stuck on one thing. Don't be eating a ribeye steak if you happen to go carnivore here every single night. Break it up. You, we have pork, we have chicken, we have fish. Mix it up and make sure that you're eating this broadly over the course of a week. That's the key thing as far as I'm concerned. A bigger factor is eating processed meat, right? Because processed meat can have added sugar in it. It also can have added umami, right? glutamate, inosine monophosphate, and so on. Plus, you've condensed this meat into a highly concentrated form. And you've already, because you've ground it up, released nucleic acids, uh, DNA, RNA, and all that stuff in there. So when you eat that, it's going to be processed a lot more efficiently by your liver. And one of the key factors here that I, I've already mentioned once in this presentation, well, I'll, I'll mention it again. Activation of this pathway is also dependent on how much of these macronutrients are arriving at the liver via the portal vein in a short time period. And processed meat is ensuring that this stuff is coming in in a high amount in a short period of time, and the liver is going, oh my God, what are you, what are you doing to me now? And that pathway is going to get opened up. Nine, intermittent fasting. This comes up all the time. And usually this is coming in from a client or questions in an electronic forum from people that have gotten to the point where they're suffering from gout flares. They've got diabetes. They're op they, they have the full cassette and they're desperate which is completely understandable. So the, the big issue with this is that in a lot of these cases, they have thrown everything they can think of at the wall. So they've lowered the carbs. 
They're doing intermittent fasting. They're taking all up pure and all, and they're doing this all at once. Well, here's the problem with formally doing intermittent fasting is that now if you deliberately add a fasting window in there, what's going to happen, think about it, is that you're going to you're going to be burning more and more fat. Your ketones are really going to go up. I mean, you know, people uh, routinely talk about hitting numbers like five millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate based on finger stick. So your kidneys are going to be uh, excreting the excess into the urine. And this is going to cause that uric acid to back up even more substantially. And I know anecdotally in my own uh, journey here that when I've had ketones, this is way back five years ago when I had ketones that were running five millimolar, my uric acid sometimes was hitting 12 megs per deciliter. I would leave intermittent fasting off the table. One thing at a time, get the lifestyle consistent right? You're going to be generating initially enough ketones as it is and backing out that uric acid. And, and one thing that people don't consider, which happens in all cases that I know of when people go into the low carb lifestyle, right? And they actually are doing a good job with it. No cheat days or the rest of that malarkey is that they will naturally evolve to a, a two meal a day eating window, which usually turns out without even trying, just eating when they're hungry, two meals a day, which automatically goes to a 16-8 window. Almost always this happens. So you don't need to bring the, the intermittent fasting in on top of this. I would recommend you hold off with that. And also the allopurinol. I'm not a medical doctor, and I actually didn't just say that, right? What you do with your... Uh, your medications is up to you. But I I would do one thing at a time. Get the lifestyle, get consistent with it. I don't I don't mean a month with it. I mean three, four, six months, and then start looking at these other issues and not bringing them in all at once. This is crucial. One thing at a time. I do one thing at a time. When I looked at tart cherry, one thing. When I looked at kerosetin, one thing. When I did the all up here and all, one thing, right? I did one thing at a time because if you put all this together, it's going to get you into trouble. Remember the issue here, the mobilization, uh, acute rises, acute decreases in uric acid uh, makes gout happy. And then finally, number 10, and I promise I'm going to address your questions uh, shortly. You need to be 360 about this. You know, if you're like me, I was, uh, I was, I think 57 when I was diagnosed with gout. And then I was 60 years old when I was diagnosed with prediabetes. Look, you don't get to have these com comorbidities uh, overnight, right? I spent decades eating the standard American diet and you and, and, and other behaviors. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So again, the eating lifestyle comes first, but you need to be thinking, right, about making this lifestyle whole. There are issues, I guess, at the top of my list here. I want to talk about this just briefly. Measure biomarkers. We see in the low-carb space right now all the rage about CGMs, continuous glucose monitors. Well, I was talking about this five years ago. Measure biomarkers. Know what your fasting glucose looks like. Know what your ketones look like. Know what your uric acid looked like. If you're an athlete, you can even measure uh, lactic acid. And you know what? Lactic acid plays a role in all this too. That's not. That's another thing that our space, the low carb space, is not even talking about yet. Um, and maybe they won't. I don't know. You can know what your biomarkers are. You, it's so easy to measure weight. And I understand. I work with people that are sugar addicted. I understand the issue with even bringing a scale up, but. You can routinely step onto one and you can track your weight loss that's going to happen in this lifestyle, right? Do you need to do it every day? Well, if you have a psychological issue with it, no, of course you don't. Maybe do it once a week. Maybe do it every two weeks. I don't care what you do with that, but get some data, right? And then there's blood pressure, right? 74% of gout sufferers have high blood pressure. When you go low carb, that blood pressure is going to start to come down. So measure it and you can track what's going to happen with that. You can see 
your blood glucose normalize. It, it's amazing how quickly it happens. You can track your ketones and you will know when you start to keto adapt because they're going to stop banging the ceiling and they're going to start becoming more consistent from one morning to the next. For, as an example, sleep is so, uh, super important to gout sufferers. You need to know whether or not you have sleep apnea because if you do, it's driving these hypoxic environments. Remember, this is a systemic problem. This is not a sliver in the finger. And the hypoxia, in combination with hyperglycemia, added sugar, alcohol, that stuff is driving these specialized conditions, right, that are, that are contributing to the gout flare. Stress. Does stress have something to do with this? Uh, I, I am not prepared to talk about this in detail yet, but it is clear cut that cortisol and insulin uh, have a role to play here because we know that fructose uric acid metabolism, when it's activated, which is going to be when these macronutrients reach a certain threshold, that hyperinsulinemia and downstream insulin resistance is driven probably most likely at the level of the liver. Just keep that in mind. So dealing with the stress, because we know that cortisol plays a role with insulin is super important. Uh, finding ways to reduce your arousal level over the course of, of a day and then exercise. Now there's going to be a lot of people, even the doctor may even bring it up. Well, when you exercise, you raise uric acid. So don't exercise. Ah, no, right? Exercise is super important to us. It's true that uric acid rises. Uric acid rises though in proportion, uh, and, and you should know this, people ask, uh, to the type of exercise you're doing. So if you're doing a, a, a HIT, uh, high intensity uh, exercise, uric acid tends to rise the most for that. Then the next in line will be strength training. And after that, it will be things like more generalized movement. But remember, that uric acid in the case of exercise is being, uh, it's being elevated normally. And the benefits that you're getting from the exercise far outweigh anything that's going on where we have a, a normal increase in uric acid going on in response to something that we're doing that is healthy for us physiological. So those are the things that need to be hand, uh, that need, that need to be addressed. So any, any sort of approach to getting gout remission really requires 360 degree outlook on how you've been living and making those changes.